uh, just in case anybody hasn't worked this out yet, uh, BIM equals opportunity, and opportunity equals work, and work is the one thing our industry needs more than anything else. And we all know that there's not going to be enough work locally to support our industry, and everybody needs to be thinking about internet nationalization. And coupled with the experience that our industry has gained over the last decade, uh, a BIM-enabled construction industry will be a very will be very attractive to the UK and greater international market, allowing us to export world-class professional design and construction services. And with that in mind, CETA established the CETA BIM Group in August 2010 with the intention of becoming the meeting place for the discussion and development of BIM. And we believe that there was no point in each organization trying to learn about BIM in isolation, but that there was great benefit in sharing the research workload and collectively develop, to developing some joined up thinking on the, on the subject. And over the last year, we've obtained official representations from some of the key stakeholders in construction, like the RAI, the ACEI, Engineers Island, the, the Chartered Surveyors, the, the Construction Industry Federation, the OPW, um, SIPC, CIAT, and for the, the country's main contractors. And we're going to continue to pull in the key stakeholders uh, in construction so that BIM can be developed in a coordinated way in this country. <coughs> and as Alan has already mentioned, next year we're going to formalize the meeting of this group um, of stakeholders in a series of high-level discussion workshops which will deal with the key issues and obstacles that will unlock and fast-track the development of BIM in Ireland. And we've already got support from the main, uh, key, the main stakeholders for the series of events and a commitment from them to send the right people who will represent the views of the institution and take back the outcomes of these, these workshops back to their members. So one of the initiatives we carried out this year was uh, in conjunction with the RIAI and the, the, um, sorry, the Department of Education was a <coughs> workshop event where a full design team worked with the Department of Education on a school design project to showcase how BIM could improve the design process and allow for a better and more integrated way of working with better design decision making and design outcomes. And the, the process we went through was to build a BIM model of the standard Department of Education generic repeat design school, or GRD school, and then explode it down to its components and then give those components to a design team to, to work on a new design for a specific site. And um, we try to demonstrate um, what BIM, the, the opportunities that BIM provided uh, for standardizing buildings at the component level rather than the whole building level, which is what the current GRD school program does. And one of the interesting, more interesting things that came out of the, the workshop was a realization from the, the, the representative from the Department of Education um, as a client, it, it, as they began to see the role that they could play in facilitating this BIM process by giving their design teams digital briefing information, 3D context, and BIM objects, and reducing the additional burden on designers who want to implement BIM. So, and so while our government might, might not be in a position to mandate BIM as we're doing in the UK, informed clients who understand the massive benefits that will accrue to them from a BIM process should try and play an active role in facilitating and enabling BIM on projects. So with that, I want to, uh, there's a short video to introduce the BIM workshop team. And while the video is playing, I'll ask them to come and take their seats. Um, the team generously con volunteered their time to prepare for and run a four-day workshop. Um, and you know, they've come here to take questions and get involved in the discussion. We had over 200 people from industry coming to the workshop over the four days to talk to the professional team about the BIM process and almost 100 invited guests attended a final presentation at the RAI on the 9th of November. And then on the 7th of December, the, the team will be demonstrating some of the lessons that they've learned uh, at the Revit User Group meeting at Trinity College. So with that, we'll get out of this and play the video. Building information modeling is probably one of the most important technologies that have 
uh, entered the construction uh, industry in, in the past 20 years. And I suppose what it is in simple terms, it's a process of generating data and managing data during the construction life cycle. It benefits all of the stakeholders in the construction industry, uh, from the owner to the designers, to the quantity surveyors, the contractors, the specialist contractors. Because what it does, it acts as an integrator between all the teams to ensure that the information is used in a more integrated manner. This initiative of the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland and the Construction IT Alliance aims to promote a higher level of understanding of BIM within the industry and the profession. In this BIM workshop, we developed a school model to respond to client-specific requirements using a visual communication tool to meet their expectations, develop the design uh, process through greater collaboration with the design team and integrate uh, their design requirements. From an MEP point of view, we see BIM as the way forward. Um, we see that there's more upfront work required from an MEP. However, the decisions that we can make at an early stage will actually affect the whole decision process. Uh, one of our objectives was to abstract quantities in a quick and efficient manner from the BIM model and put costs against those in the timelines that we had set out. This we achieved uh, very efficiently and in a timely manner. And from my point of view, I think the intuitive controls of the software made it very easy uh, to develop design development and also really easy to swap out materials um, and that was really um, fantastic. Interacting with other members of the design team uh, in a more streamlined and fluid manner has helped us to develop our uh, MEP model and to provide more certainty in terms of the design that moves on to the construction stage. I spend most of my time helping teams to collaborate and I witnessed with this uh, workshop uh, huge amount of barriers being broken down both social and technical and I can see huge uh, potential for uh, all parties concerned. The effects of using BIM will make decisions on orientation, uh, room routes and risers, materials uh, more efficient and effective and that the building product would be much better at the, at the end. The BIM process isn't something that should be undertaken lightly. It is changing the existing and entrenched inefficient ways in which we are working. Um, it needs a high level of support and it needs proper training for your staff in order for it to be implemented properly in practice. We certainly found this process um, of huge uh, benefit uh, to us working uh, as architects within this industry um, and it's something that is uh, inevitable in the industry as it offers huge advantages to the design process. I will never go back to CAD, I think that's archaic. Um, BIM is definitely the future. We found the process very um, positive and the benefits to the end users of schools viewing their building virtually and developing it, it would be a wonderful uh, process to be uh, truly partaking. BIM Tools is a great opportunity for uh, clients and professionals to collaborate and deliver great products and buildings. The delivery of high quality buildings that meet the performance criteria of a low carbon future within tightly controlled capital budgets is an, uh, an important challenge that needs to be addressed with a new way of thinking and a new way of working. The workshop week was, from our point of view, an extremely successful week. We were overwhelmed by the interest of the numbers of people who turned up. It was great to see the interest among the profession for BIM at the moment in the country, and we hope that that will continue. There will be a further presentation at the CETA uh, workgroup meeting on the 25th of November. You'll get information on that online at CETA website. The BIM workshop team have demonstrated a new format of collaborative working in a more integrated way um, through this technology and process called BIM. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bone Workshop team. And, uh, what I thought I'd do is give, I don't maybe ask one question of each of the, the participants just to kind of get the conversation going, and then we would open it up to the floor to, um, to take questions uh, from the audience. So maybe Ian, as a project manager, you often the first person to be talking to the clients. I mean, what would you? Thing over brings to, to your profession? I think um, 
clients uh, depending on where what their store point is. I mean, I've heard Jared say that. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Jared say that uh, most of our activity is going to be in relation to existing assets. So I think for FM, um, what uh, clients should do or should uh, act on straight away, it's, it's nothing to do with models, it's just to actually collect the data of your assets. Uh, so monitor your buildings, perhaps even the room by room, if you're think, thinking about occupancy, energy, uh, water, uh, all those kind of things. Um, and that data is going to help you analyze your buildings and how to optimize them, and how to engage with BIN teams uh, to work a strategy of, um, uh, of expenditure, prioritized expenditure, which will, should be, you know, uh, I think a key activity for, for state organizations. Um, from a construction point of view, uh, we should look at uh, at an early stage, the client should be thinking about preparing a digital brief, or at least a, a substantial part of the brief being digital, to hand to a BIM team. Uh, and to prepare, to provide more information earlier, to engage with their own stakeholders and bring them to the table. Um, and uh, I suppose uh, ensure that they get the right people working on the job, and not to approach the project in a mean way. Um, to look for the right individuals to bring the right people into the room at the right time. Whether that's a, a legal team, a design team, or their own stakeholders are users of the building. And so I think really that's, uh, for clients they have to be aware of what to look for uh, and to, to engage with the right people. Thanks, Jim. Thomas Sexton from Cody Partnership Architects. Thomas, um, as an architect, um, how has BIM you know, affected your approach to, to the design and the process? Um, I suppose, I just focused on a few things that we learned, particularly during the, the workshop in terms of uh, our approaches as, as designers. For a very broad story uh, today, just to kind of focus on the kind of earlier design stage. Um, I suppose through, and actually producing building model, we found that um, it really helped the designer approach the design of the building in a much more holistic uh, way. So it's traditionally, when you're looking at early design um, ideas, you're, you're drawing um, just a small number of drawings to, to explore different options. You don't have to draw a, a lot of um, body of work um, in examining those in case you have to backtrack on, on some of the issues. So you're starting with plans, you use sections, some time later you're actually looking at elevations and rear elevation, and um, it might be producing the, the kind of result that you hope to work from the very beginning. So we felt as we were doing the model, we actually see it in the whole very early on and allows us to have better exploration and better innovation of the actual design intent. Um, as we developed our, our concept model, it's been very, very, very outset. Um, they're very, very simple models, but the idea that we to explore how other members of the design team could interact with our early models. And what we found there uh, through workshop was a very early stage we could actually get uh, you know, early energy studies, um, floor wall ratios, looking at the kind of cost applications of different uh, building forms, and um, very able to get environmental feedback. And uh, what we found is that the, mod, the simple model we produced could be used by others for other analysis that um, even we weren't uh, thinking of at the time. I suppose traditionally, other design team members are slow to get involved in your design because your drawings are much more developed at that stage. You make fundamental decisions that. Um, that, that are, uh, you know, it's a huge amount of work to go back and change them. And I suppose uh, better communication, and that's more, that's within our office, and also um, in client presentation. Uh, for peer review within the office, if something's modeled up, it's very easy for for, um, uh, for directors, uh, seniors in the office to see what's being developed by, by the design architect and being made to come to us at a very early stage. And uh, inevitably, it's much better communication to your clients as well to show them uh, your design intent to meet and exceed their expectations or being told weeks later that's not quite what I anticipated. So uh, there were really three big gains we found uh, during the workshop process you know, focusing on. And we're going to Joe Madigan from French Consulting Engineers Structural Civil. Yeah, Structural Civil point of view, what did, what did you get out of the workshop? What is it, what did you get out of the Not envisaged that the big process was speed. 
speed up our day-to-day -day work of designing and detailing significantly. Um, there are certain benefits uh, in seeing things with preliminary analysis and in some of the detailing. But what we have seen is that the use of a green model allows for a more screen up the streamlined process. Um, it's amazing how much uh, it avoids duplication of effort and reduces support for disconnected workflow that <coughs> can be exist in the industry. Um, as engineers, we can also respond more creatively to design options being explored by the architect at the early stage of the project. We can make valuable, we can make valuable contributions here uh, to the design process and validate these through the analysis tools that are available and more accurately predict the final detail solution. Maybe Keith, uh, Keith Mellon from Ethos Engineering and Sitka for the MEP Services. Give us some feedback on um, yeah, what, what improvements you found to the whole design through the, the workshop. Sure. Um, well, I suppose as engineers involved in the use of energy within a building, we, we always like to get involved in the, the form and the shape of the building at a very early stage and to sort of demonstrate the range of our potential influencing the form and the shape and uh, the, the life cycle costs and um, we can quickly assess a number of options uh, through the use of a BIM process uh, and it allows us to sort of realize the potential of our, our, our skills um, uh, in a much greater fashion than we can currently do in a 2D uh, restricted design process and that allows for uh, <coughs> progression of the building design onto the detail design stage um, whereby we're not necessarily backtracking on decisions we've made at the concept stage because we found that issues aren't actually resolved. Um, and then moving into the design stage, we run into, uh, on a daily basis, coordination issues in terms of looking at 2D drawings and uh, moving towards the tender stage, ensuring that they're coordinated. And uh, only this week and last week we've been involved in meetings whereby We've been having discussions with architects saying we need sections in this area to demonstrate how a services strategy is going to work. Um, whereas if we're using a BIM system, we can literally pull this up on the screen and put a section of view of what's in the model in a matter of seconds. So we don't necessarily have to spend as much time in coordination meetings. Um, we don't necessarily have to spend as much time developing drawings. Like Jerry alluded said, there's, not, there's not a reduction in the duplication of work involved. Um, so from our point of view, there's, there's enormous efficiencies there to be availed of within the design process. And I think um, the speakers alluded to earlier in relation to mitigation of risks in the construction stage. Um, that again is a time consuming feature of our, of our work, attending site meetings to discuss some coordination issues that contractors have, uh, whereby the design can be fully developed in a 2D format. With the use of BIM, we can develop those issues and we can mitigate the risks associated with costs, time on site for our contractors, um, and in these disputes that can occur. Yeah. We'll Moving on to Michael Lambert, uh, who works for KSN, the Frontier Surveyors, um, and uh, probably engaging with the model has been a new experience as a quantity surveyor. Some people have suggested that the technology might uh, obligate, uh, obliviate the role of the quantity surveyor. Um, I mean, how would you respond? What is your, your experience of the role? Well, there is a perception out there that um, with the use of the BIM technology that the QS um, its role will be reduced and it won't be required. That's not the case in our experience. Um, there's no magic button that produces the quantities or a cost plan. What the BIM model does for us is it does a lot of the heavy lift in terms of generating the, the quantities for use in our bill of quantities. Um, it's up to us then to make sense of that information and uh, derive the information into a, to, to, to make sense of it. Um, another issue which we found in the schedules coming from the model was that we needed to check that the information coming from the model was correct and uh, correct and in the format that we needed to reduce the costs. Um, one particular issue that came up in the workshop um, the windows was a T-shaped window. I think you showed it on one of your images earlier. Um, and we derived the quantities from that initially. And we took the maximum width, the maximum height of that window, which meant that the overall quantity of windows was higher than, than uh, what it should have been. So, you know, that was an issue that, that uh, <coughs> 
enjoyed our experience, although we saw that the end was too high. Um, I suppose what BIM presents for the quantity surveyors is a great opportunity. It's an opportunity to become integrated into the design process at a very early stage and is to be collaborative with the design, the design team and the clients to bring the whole value engineering process forward um, and to, to bring cost certainty into the equation at a very early stage. Um, and I think that's where the value of the quantity surveyors role will, will uh, definitely come out through the BIM process. Redefine, but not get rid of your role. Okay. Trevor, maybe we'll move on to you because Trevor has, an, has a, Q, a QS background and an IT expert. So sort of instrumental in helping the team to kind of bring all these bits of data together into usable formats. Um, and there are still challenges there. But maybe you could just share some of your experience. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the I'll tell you QS thing stinks, but instead of the quantity slayer, I think we'd have to learn to quiz them and get a dog. And the quantity shepherds, um, I think it's just rounding up our quantities. I mean, there are challenges there with the models. I mean, it's crap in, crap out. I mean, we can take them on this and assume all the quantities can be able to work. They're not. And it's not a specific animal application. The quantities still need oversight. The big challenges from, from the QS perspective, as I can see them, is the fact that QS is having engaged in the process at all. Very few QS attend the workshop. And um, just using the example that the, um, the guys had with Manchester Library this morning, it was a 3D design team. But from my reading of it, the QS went back to a 2D process. It's not the drawings and data quantities and cost plans from 2D, as far as I can, I, I can read. Um, big challenge for QS is really getting the, the, the models at the minute contain information. I mean, information in the state that's given a context. QS needs to turn the information into knowledge. And I think to do that, they're going to need to rely on hooking in cost databases, which is a big problem with the industry at the moment. There's no standard cost databases. There's no standard coding system. Um, I see Andrew refer to Uniclass uh, in his presentation. As an industry, we need to look at coming up with some sort of a standard coding or classification system, be it Uniclass, Omniclass, master format. So there are challenges. QS need to get engaged and uh, <coughs> with interoperability. And I was trying to focus on low cost or low cost solutions for QS to actually take off quantities. We have a lot done, but you know, there's still a lot more to do from the QS perspective. Well, Although it was a design workshop, we decided to invite a contractor into the process um, and just to see how you know, interacting with the with the model and the design team. From the contractor's point of view, Paul Stewart from Stewart Construction, and what do you see the build process you know, bringing for contractors? Uh, well, I suppose a few notes here. Nothing that hasn't been said already. You know, I'm not going to say anything new. I suppose you heard it all today in, in another way. Uh, we obviously we get a much greater understanding from a visual aspect of just simply looking at, at a building, being able to walk through it, and therefore. You know, a foreman who can look through a building and be able to see will get a much better idea of the constructability of it. And invariably, I suppose, if we're involved at an earlier stage, we can also, uh, you know, have some input in how to help designers design in a cost-effective way uh, that makes it more buildable. Um, I also see, obviously, there there is that that will reduce risk. We we'll reduce risk by being able to look at it and, and absolutely be able to price it correct. We can't really come along and say, "Ah, oh, well, we didn't see that." Or, you know. <laughs> so, um, so from a constructive, well, we can still try now. <laughs> 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 um, from a constructability and scheduling aspect, I suppose. Look, there, there's there's obvious uh, there's obviously uh, benefits in that that we can physically show people how we want to build a building. Um, but I suppose the major elements are, are this are clash detection is probably one of the, the major elements. And that means that the amount of time that we spend when we actually find a mistake on site trying to rectify it. I mean when a when a service runs into a beam, that's a problem. <coughs> and it's horrendously expensive to, to uh, fix that problem. So clearly it can eliminate those and look with the best will of the world, that it still happens. You know, they, they still do. 
uh, uh, coordination drawings still aren't perfect. <coughs> and to be fair, in 3D, they, they are more likely to be perfect. Um, again, I suppose from a from, uh, remeasurable point of view, uh, it makes it much easier to remeasure items um, at, a, at a later stage. And I see again as well the same thing. FM handing over a, a building where we take in uh, contractors, would say subcontractors, uh, ME, that if they can, if we can hand over a a, um, a safety file, um, an operations manual uh, in in a single model, I can see that having great benefits in the future. I mean, if someone can click on on uh, if if a facilities manager in one building can click on on uh, something and it says it was serviced two weeks ago, this is who serviced it, uh, this is where they bought the boiler or whatever, it means they won't ring me. <laughs> and that's what I don't want them to do. So um, again, the other big element I see is hopefully it will reduce the cost of subcontractor involvement. Currently, um, I think that we'd be further on in the design stage where if you can hand a model to a subcontractor, like a steel, steel structure or that, they don't have to go through. Currently, they redraw the whole thing uh, in 2D, um, and it's just and, and produce shop drawings, hand over the shop drawing. Okay, maybe it won't eliminate shop drawings, but to be fair, it would definitely reduce the their cost and therefore a cost to the industry. I mean, and the same thing could be said of M and E particularly. The coordination drawings. If you've gone to that stage, contractors, subcontractors shouldn't have as much cost in reproducing essentially a whole new uh, coordinated drawing. So I feel that down the line it's a much greater saving to the industry we don't even see. You know, so um, I suppose that's really uh, the benefits I see on it. And hope there is some help. <coughs> and one of the interesting things about the workshop is uh, the individuals involved are all, we're all new to them in three, since so while the companies may have used them before. Would be a week, three months ago, we're new to them, and uh, yeah, I think we wanted to show that this isn't something that nobody can get into. That everybody can get up to speed, speed fairly quickly, uh, which I think is I mean, was a great result out of that. And uh, maybe Pat, we're going to you. I mean, as the BIM consultant that worked with the team to to bring them through this process, um, what key advice could you maybe give to people who are considering? Probably two things really. I mean, it was clearly a fundamentally different way for clients, design teams, contractors, and engineers to collaborate and communicate in designing the building. And it, it has the potential to sort of revolutionize the way you can work on the project. And it's really key that it's, it's not something that you just say, my IT manager or my account manager will take this on and we won't. It. It's key that the senior executives, that the directors, the departments and practices fully understand the implications of implementing BIM on projects and understanding the challenges that the team are going to face and properly supporting the team and giving the team the support and the time to learn and the resources you know, to learn on the first project. They may not get all the benefits on the first project, they'll get the benefits on the second, third, fourth projects. So don't expect everything up front, don't expect everything at once, but do understand the facilitate the team. I think with that, maybe we would open up to one or two questions from the, the audience. <coughs> Somebody take the mics from us there. Anybody? 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 Maybe say your name and who you're directing the question at. Okay, uh, Mark Hudson from Coachway. A question for, for Ian, please. I saw that um, you had somebody from the Department of Education that came along for, uh, to see the workshop and how it uh, progressed and the benefits that uh, might come out of it. Uh, and I suppose with the, uh, the, the spend of the government now is going to be focused on health and education, building new schools. Uh, and I suppose the driver for BIM is going to be um, in the contracts, in the public works contracts. As Damien said, um, it has to be an addendum put onto the public works contract to derive the fact that BIM is, is needed. Uh, how far away do you think we are? And it's a tough question, but how far away do you think we are 
from that being addended onto the public works contract so they have to use it because surely he must have seen that there is a cost benefit to them being used. I don't think I can definitively answer how long, uh, I think Gerard might have a better take on that, um, but I, there is an imperative there, whether it's a cost one, but of course it's uh, from Andrew's presentation, there's, uh, there's other deeper issues as well, uh, there's a carbon issue, and we have, uh, the governments of Europe have a commitment to 2020, uh, you know, you've got to ask the question, how are you going to get there, and how long is it going to take, and how much is it going to cost you, and where do you spend your money first? if you don't have all the money up front. Um, so how do you prioritize that expenditure? First thing you've got to do is digitize your assets and take it from there uh, and start implementing a, a process of uh, staged implementation. It, I mean, I think the challenge for the, the organization at the moment is to actually create that plan and digitize their assets. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it's encouraging to hear what Jared had to say about getting new licenses and so on. Um, but perhaps, uh, Outside of the OPW, there needs to be some leadership. Um, the government advisor in the UK, perhaps we should have one as a <coughs> of departments there, Department of Finance creating a, 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 you know, our current public works contract. It, it you know, makes you wonder uh, about where the leadership is going to come from uh, to actually uh, sort of, uh, not so much force through, but encourage uh, a bit of policy and process. Okay. So, well, I, would, I would say as well that um, the seat of the working group, and the tension of it is that we all work together. I mean, we are a small market, you know, and everybody's kind of waiting around for somebody else to put something in place before they step in. Um, so I mean, that's what we're going to do with the series next year, is actually just put everybody in the same room and say, let's talk about the modena or whatever, and let's just get it sorted together. You know, if the industry works together, we can, we can make a move, rather than everybody waiting for someone else to put something in place. You know, it's, we are. So, um, any other questions? Yeah, I'll go on here. Hello. Um, two questions. <laughs> I can see you're building your model from a, an FM and end, an end user point of view, but uh, more directed to the construction guy over there, Dr. Uh, Einstein. Did you design, incorporate any safety elements? Did you design for safety when you were putting it together, or did you design for off-site construction um, modular? Building? Well, in this instance, no. I suppose we didn't we didn't go into it in as much detail. To be fair, it's not exactly the most intricate design in the world either. Like you know, so from a health and safety perspective, um, I can see the benefits from health and safety in terms of we, we, we spoke about potentially bringing in scaffolding and showing the scaffolding being built around and seeing, for example, if you were digging trenches or are there after whether there would be an issue in terms of, of um, you know, scaffolding legs, when scaffolding had to be moved, etc., those kind of items. But we didn't envisage, it's a, it's a simplistic two-story, so, so we didn't really have to go into health and safety in a, in a major way. Now, in a modular build, in, term, in, in a heavy steel structural sense, I could see it being of benefit in, in health and safety from when you put up your edge protections, etc. Uh, in this instance, not, it, as I say, not a very complex uh, design at this stage. Um, so from a health and safety perspective, uh, no, we didn't go into any dramatic detail on it. I mean, we looked at it, but we didn't feel that it necessitated any major, uh, um, not that we don't care about health and safety. <laughs> <laughs> but I assume you see the, the, the benefits of the off-site construction, off-site build, and um, just in terms of every to site for... The, the Absolute, absolutely, and in fairness, I suppose, uh, from from an initial drafting perspective, right? When those when, when people have have those uh, um, elements drafted for once, the the amount of reusable knowledge that they now have of the database is, is phenomenal. And I mean, we see system build schools, etc., being a major element, and you can see that that in this instance it would be very helpful. But also another instance that I know that the Department of Education were talking about was that. Uh, um, they are now doing an awful lot of extensions onto buildings, right? They're doing set, and, and the fact that um, they now have only 2D drawings, etc. Uh, they were talking about would it be great now um, to be able to just latch on uh, a toilet block or something 
straight onto the side of a building and, and there it is, it's, it's done, instead of having to draw 20 sections through again and go on. So. Uh, I'll also have a second question in terms of uh, build verification. Once we're finished, how do we, do we go back and verify that the model was built, or that the structure was built to the model? Well, I suppose that's it. That, that you, move, you move back to the same way that we do it currently to some degree. I suppose it's an as-built drawing uh, situation <coughs> where, where, where we map them. Now, in this instance, what, what I feel is, is we're not going to end up putting in, you know, laser technology to try and figure out whether we put the wall in the right place or not, you know. Um, but I suppose um, really as-built, currently as-built technologies, uh, you know, as-built I mean, <coughs> drawing are basically done where, where they're resurveyed. But that really only tends to happen in, in um, I suppose, uh, in pipe work externally and, and things like that. And to be fair, um, I mean, I, what, what we'll end up doing is, is either redrawing that again and then adding it on to the model as a final model. But it would be done in the same way as it's done now, to be honest. It's not going to change dramatically. Just on the health and safety aspect, it's a particular interest of mine. Very quickly, with the model, irrespective of format, you know, you can develop a small piece of software or protocol where you can run through the model as a contractor and instantiate or find instances where you're working over three meters of height, or you might need mobile platforms or uh, mobile towers. Um, you should be able to sweep through the model and identify everywhere you need edge protection uh, or anywhere you must need fall arrest systems. Um, or possible areas where you have conflicts with, with cranage, exclusion zones for hot works permits and that sort of stuff where you want to have on-site fabrication. All of that can be done quite easily from the models with, with a little bit of work. And just in terms of, of health and safety for contractors, if you go for the aspect alone, it's well worth the, 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 the investment. Uh -huh. <coughs> Angus O'Keefe from Brown and Adonum Consulting Engineers. Uh, rather than a question, I just have a comment on Jared's very informative uh, presentation. Uh, there was a slide which showed three government departments who could benefit from the implementation of BIM. And I'd just like to add, if, if you were to step up a level from building information modeling to product modeling in general, that certainly the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport could be added to that list. Um, there's a significant amount of benefit that could be gained from using product modeling on roads and bridges. We're already seeing it in ROD from a roads point of view with the use of civil 3D, um, from design right through to, to construction. Um, but certainly uh, there's a lot of benefit to be gained in, in bridge design as well. Very complex geometry, complex construction, large scale bridges. It's already been demanded by some clients internationally. And I think it's something that um, in terms of asset management and construction of bridges and roads in Ireland, that the Department of Transport should be focusing on. And that's something that, that CETA uh, could keep an eye on over the next couple of years. James Hi, um, how are you doing? It's uh, Patrick Leonard here. I'm from a, a, a company called Saval Limited, where we specialize in data centered uh, design systems. Also, I'm representing the uh, computer division in, Ed in Engineers Ireland. Um, very quickly, um, it's, it's more of a statement really than anything else. Like, um, the step up for the step up for BIM for most most companies in this country who are SMEs, the step up is going to be expensive. And um, this is this is largely due to the fact that um, buying buying software is not going to yield a BIM system. But there is a considerable amount of configuration work, maintenance work, and ongoing evolution with with attached to to owning any of these systems. Um, so it, it becomes obvious then that there's a lot of work replication across every site in that activity. And um, it's just a statement really because I don't think that uh, level of work replication is being addressed on any level at the moment, not to my knowledge. I just, uh, that's a statement I can put out there. represents lots of opportunities. Yeah. George Wild, Billsoft. Um, uh, in general, when a, an organization uh, goes to invest in technology, they're looking for um, 
improve, improvements in efficiency and hopefully cost savings um, affecting, hopefully, profit. Um, I noticed from Jared's in the OPW um, a comment he made, a leap of faith. Is there no hard data from the US or from Asia that would highlight the benefits cost-wise to the stakeholders and all the professions that could convince people <coughs> to invest in these technologies. It is hard data, people don't believe it because it comes from the States. Well, no, if you, if you haven't highlighted it at all, I mean, in general terms, what happened today and before, I haven't seen ever an actual scenario where you're looking at, say, a school that was built using BIM and a school that was built not using BIM. And, you know, the difference in cost savings for the client and for the stakeholders, and for the professions. That sort of analysis, I think, would help people make the decision. I think you had two very similar approaches, but Stanford did a study in 2007 on 32 BIM projects and documented the benefits, but as I said, nobody believes that. I think, let's take one more question, and then um, the team are going to be in the room where the coffee was afterwards, and they have a, comp a copy of the model there, so if you want to talk to Hello, it's Peter Daly with Smart Builders Law Firm. I have a question for Ralph. Um, we've we've um, heard an awful lot today about design um, and the use of BIM at the design phase, how that can feed into whole of life costing and uh, you know, even more ecological buildings and so on. But uh, from the point of view of using BIM at the actual construction phase, where do you see the main opportunities there? How will it be used by uh, main contractors? Yeah. Well, maybe just to preface that, I mean, the reason we're focusing on this design is because talking to people in the industry, the excuse you get from contractors is, well, we're not doing them, but we're not getting design models. Uh, and you talk to the engineers and they say, well, we're not doing them because the architects aren't giving us models. So yeah, the, I think the design team, is, and, and specifically the architects, start to embrace them. Yeah, that those models will hopefully filter down and that there's massive opportunities for the contractors and again I think if you, if you read the study that I mentioned from Stanford uh, you, you know, the, the opportunities that come to contractors in the clash detection alone they were talking measuring 10 percent you know reduction in costs now I mean in an industry where contractors are working on margins of probably less than a half a percent at this stage um, 10 percent is massive you know I mean if you to any contract, I'm sure Paul would agree. If you could save 10%, sure if we get the half percent, we don't know what So, yeah, again, it's a, it's a thing of working together. Like, if the designers are producing models and sharing those models um, and, and it's filtering down to the, to the contractors, they get the benefit. And ultimately, the clients get the benefit. And I suppose the one big message that should come out of all of this is that clients should not divorce themselves and <coughs> see it as something that designers should do or contractors should do. And they have a specific role in understanding them, what it will bring for them, and in facilitating the team. You know, in other words, don't put a you know a very tight timeline if it's the first BIM project your team are doing, or don't try and cut the hell out of the fees if it's if you know they haven't invested yet. You know, like be part of the process and facilitate them and, and enable them. So, sorry, Ralph, just to address that quickly from Peter. There's been huge developments in the area of getting BIM elements tablets in the field in the past, um, I'd say, three or four months. All of the vendors, Autodesk, uh, Bentley's, and, and Archicad have all come up with iPad clients that will allow you to take the model out into the field and interact with it. Um, and getting the model out into the field where, where uh, trace people can see it and can interact with it and can look at how a shuttering form is going to be set up in a stair core. That's where it is going to be at. It's getting the 3D out in the field where it can be used rather than bringing out 2D drawings again for visualization. And it's getting it out in the field for pre-commissioning and moving towards zero defects, which are snagging and issuing non-conformances and bolting on systems like yours, where you're actually monitoring conformance to or building to the model as it's actually happening. So I think getting it on, into people's hands out on the job site is where it's going to, where it is getting to. So I think we end there and I just I want to say a big thank you to the team again for all the effort they put in to just basically showcase BIM to our industry. So it's the BIM workshop team. Thank you.
like to close the meeting, so I'd like to thank all the speakers, Nahim and Andrew and Jared and Damien, uh, for bringing the, the expert uh, opinion to this round table. I'd like to encourage people who aren't engaging with the BIM process to join the, the CETA BIM group, get involved in the discussion, um, ask questions, and uh, let's work together to raise the industry and, uh, and get work.